We're in First Thessalonians chapter 5. We're slowly drawing this to the end. But we're in the section where Paul begins to give command after command after command about how to live our lives. If you go back and you begin to look and you look at verse 16, it says, Rejoice always. Then he says, Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. And then we come to the verses that we're looking at tonight, verses 21 and 22. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And it's going to take a couple of nights to get through this. Because when you look at it, it sounds like a pretty simple thing. It says, test all things. And so, I gave a title to the sermon. It's called, How to Be an Examiner. How to examine things. You go into a doctor's office and you get an examination. And they check the different aspects of your body, as in they take blood and different samples, and they check your blood pressure, check your temperature, and they look at these things and they begin to diagnose what is going on with you, whether you're healthy or you're ill, what needs to be done. I know a guy that's an examiner, if you will, for the state of Mississippi, and he examines the budget or audits the budget, same type of meaning. And so at the end of each year, he has to do an audit on everything that the state of Mississippi spends. You know how much money that is? Neither do I. But when he got through, he had got it down to within two pennies. Pretty good, isn't it? And he would examine receipts and bills and contracts and payouts and council checks. He'd do the whole deal. And he'd go through the whole process, examining the books, if you will, to come to that conclusion. So we need to be good examiners. That's what it really means when it says, test all things. Paul even writes, and it says, examine yourself. And they translate the same word, examine yourself, to see whether or not you're in the kingdom. So there are times that we need to be people that can examine and to understand what's going on. You know, it, it's really amazing to me how bad decisions, our reasoning, our superficial understanding, the shallow knowledge that we have, the widespread ignorance that we have, and those things that we have as people have contributed more anguish to the church throughout the history of the church than all the persecution of the church combined. That's pretty rough stuff. You know, there is no life so precise and demanding as a Christian's life. Because the Christian's life calls for precision on the outside in terms of behavior. But there must also be precision on the inside in terms of thought and belief. So what am I saying? We need to have discernment. We call it examinations. We call it testing, testing the spirits. But we need, as Christian people, to have discernment. Discernment in how we live our life. Discernment in making decisions, good, bad, or otherwise. So I want to give you some thoughts before we get started. In Christianity, and this is where we get into trouble, there are no changing morals. The Bible is clear, and it is firm, and it is unchanging, and so the morals found in the Scriptures do not change. 
They do not. Even though we like to change them in our mind and we become situation ethics type people, the morals found in the scriptures do not change. And there are a list of things that do not change. Abortion is a moral action or immoral action that the Bible speaks against and it will always speak against it. Homosexuality is a moral or immorality that the Bible speaks against and it will always speak against it. Drunkenness is an immorality that the Bible speaks against and it will always speak against it. Do you see the pattern? The things that you find in the scriptures that talk about morality and immorality will never change in the scriptures. God will never change. God changes not. And so our beliefs and the ethics that we have, if they've changed, it's because we changed them, not God has changed them. And there is a picture of that in the Scriptures. In the Scriptures, the Pharisees came to Jesus and they were talking to Him about divorce. And they said this, they asked Him, was it right to divorce or not? And He answered with this, Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness of man's heart. He didn't say God allowed it. He doesn't say I allowed it. He said Moses allowed it because Moses had pressure on him. And Moses is a person that is sinful by nature just like you and I. And so Jesus is actually condemning what Moses allowed. Let there be no doubt about it. So when you look at Christianity today, and you see that it is filled with immorality and low-level commitment to holy living, we understand that it is a choice that we make. It is not what God has allowed. How do we know the difference? By examining ourselves and understanding discernment. So that's what we're looking at today. So with that as an introduction, I want us to begin to think about examining ourselves. We are to examine... And I want you to know that's not easy to do. Never let a preacher tell you it's easy to look at someone else or yourself and examine yourself and think it's easy to do. It is not. Why? Becomes the question. Why is it hard to examine yourself? Why is it hard to have discernment and use that discernment wisely? And I'm going to give you three quick reasons before we get into the sermon for tonight. Okay? Reason number one, why? Human weakness. We are fallen thinkers. Our mind has that fallen state that came with Adam in the garden when he sinned, and it is passed down from generation to generation. Human weakness is brought about because we think with a, a, a broken mind, if you will. We think with a unethical mind, with an immoral mind, with a mind that we normally feed trash to instead of the good things of God. How often do we feed trash to our minds? Every time we cut on the TV. Every time we listen to the country music radio station or the rock and roll radio station. Every time we watch a, a movie that's just not right and it's about killing or, or immoral sex or it shows terrible, terrible moral living. We feed our mind those things, and Paul says you need to starve them and feed your mind the good things of life. Starve your mind from those filthy things and feed your mind the things of God. So why is it hard to examine ourselves? We think with fallen minds. We have a human weakness. Second reason, satanic deceit. Satan attacks believers. He did it in the garden, right? With Adam and Eve. And they knew God better than we will ever know God. Because they looked upon the face of God in the garden. They walked in the cool of the eve with God. They communed with God. They were on a first name basis with God, if you will. Every evening he came. And they dealt with him. They talked with him. They had a relationship with him that we will never have until we get to heaven. 
So Satan attacked them. He's certainly attacking us. And as he attacked them in their pure state and they fail, how are we going to overcome in our fallen state? Human weakness, satanic deceit. And here's the big one. We live in an ungodly world. We are assaulted from every side by the immorality of this world, by the mind of this world. Everything that we stand for is under attack, and it's not really Satan attacking it. It is the people that want to be the gods of their own lives. When you talk about abortion, it is people that want to, to have their own say-so about who they are and who has life and when life begins. They're taking that right from God. They want to be gods of their own lives. So we live in an ungodly world, and you can go through the whole list, and all it is is that the people of the world want to rule themselves and do not want to have a God ruling them. So we have human weakness, we have satanic deceit, and we have ungodly world that we live in. So what keeps us from understanding what we examine? Because Paul says, examine yourselves, and we are to test ourselves. So once we run this test, why don't we understand what we just did? When we examine the oil stick in a car, you pull that oil stick out, and if there's no oil on the oil stick, what do we do? Put oil in the motor, right? What happens if you don't put oil in the motor? Motor locks up, freezes up, got to have a new car or a new motor. Well, you've put the oil in there that's necessary. And it's just like life. We look at ourselves, and we need to understand what we have examined, and then we need to fix the problem. If the problem needs to be a spiritual quart of oil, put it in. If it needs to, uh, to have air in the tires spiritually, air them up. We need to adjust our life based on what we see and what we understand God, God's Word calling us to do. We need to fix the problem. So what keeps us from understanding? Number one, doctrinal conviction. Most churches are not concerned with doctrine anymore. Do y'all believe that? Most churches do not care. I didn't realize it until I was in a seminary class. And in the seminary class, they took us out to a Southern Baptist church uh, in Jackson, outside of Jackson, in the metro area. And in that metro area church, they were leading the state and the, most of the southeast in baptisms. So we sat down as a class, and we were allowed to talk to the pastor and ask the pastor questions. And we asked him what really... Uh, brought about these major baptisms that they were having. To which he replied, well, we don't require a profession of faith from people like Catholics. Now, I believe Catholics are Christians, but they didn't require them to make a profession of faith. And he went through a whole list of people that were able to join the church and come to them in baptism without ever receiving Christ or making a public profession of faith. The doctrinal conviction that needs to be applied there is, I am not ashamed of the gospel, and if I'm a Christian, I'm going to make it public. Churches don't care. Not only that, you think about biblical preaching. Most churches do not care about the Bible today anymore. Most churches do not hold the Bible to be uh, airless and infallible. Most churches believe that the Bible is just a good book, and they don't care if the sermon comes out of the Bible or not. There are many churches now where the preacher tells stories and never opens the Bible. Southern Baptist churches. I'm not talking about a different denomination. I'm talking about our own folks. There are a lot of churches that get no doctrinal training from the pulpit anymore. And there's something wrong with that. 
So, what do we do about it? Is it important? Well, you need to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And while we're there, we will read verses 1, 2, and 3. Paul writes this letter to Timothy, and in chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, he says, I charge you. Paul is charging Timothy. Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing at his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. Now get this, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. I went to a church. And we were on vacation, and we went to a big church. And the pastor wasn't preaching, but I believe it was a youth minister. And he told us his story about going to the beach and putting his kids in a rig shawl type thing with a bicycle with a carriage behind it and had a big covering over it and trying to pedal that thing to the beach and the wind caught it. And he just had to keep working to overcome adversity. To my knowledge, and I may be wrong, I don't remember any Bible being read. I don't remember the rest of the sermon. Because that's not what preaching is about. Look with me again. In verse 2 it says, preach the what? Preach the word. When? In season, out of season. Preach the word. Convince. Convince what? People about the gospel. About the word. Rebuke. With what? The word. Exhort. Encourage. What? With the word. With all long suffering, settle in and teach the word of God. Because that's the only thing that makes a difference in a person's life. So the problem with the church, and the problem with the church is not the walls, right? The problem is with the people. The people in most churches are not getting the doctrinal conviction they need because they're not hearing doctrine from the pulpit anymore. So it must change. Here's the second reason. How come we can't understand when we examine someone or we're trying to use discernment? is because people don't stand firm any longer. And this is nothing new. A hundred years ago, people knew that the preacher was a respected man if he was a God-called man, and he would preach the gospel, and the people had honor and respect to the preacher. But times have changed. And because the word is not being taught like it should be, there's no respect, and people don't stand on the word any longer. Turn with me to Titus, Timothy Titus, chapter 1 and verse 9. Paul writes to Titus, and he says, Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convict those who contradict. In other words, there's a couple of things there. He says, Titus, you need to know the word, so hold fast. Do you remember that word, hold fast, is a military term? You stand your ground, they're fighting with swords, the Roman army's marching up in rank, and, and so nobody moves. You don't give up your position without an order. You stand there and you fight until either you're killed or you kill everybody's coming to you. They'll blow a whistle, you'll get a break, the next guy come up, he'll stand his ground. So you hold your ground as he has been taught. 
that comes from the pulpit. The doctrine and the holding fast is based on what comes from the pulpits in our Southern Baptist churches, and they're becoming weak. What's the purpose? That the people that are being taught will be able, by sound doctrine, taught from the pulpit, will be able to lift people up and convict people of those sins, especially those who contradict the lifestyle and word of God. So it's important. We don't have the discernment. We're not able to understand what we examine because we don't have doctrinal conviction and people don't stand firm on God's word any longer. Number three, the church believes... It must be popular. Y'all ever been to a popular church? Popular churches are ones that the people don't like the preacher to preach very long. Okay? I'm going to just tell you. A 15-minute sermon would be fine. Some of, some of us might like a 15-minute sermon. Right? You're not going to get it from me. Okay? We like a 40-minute sermon or a 30-minute sermon. I mean, a whole service. You come in, you spend 25 minutes singing. It doesn't matter what style of music. is. It doesn't matter. You're going to sing. You're going to welcome one another. You want to preach or preach 15 minutes. Give an invitation. Maybe one verse of a song. We'll get out the door. We'll go to the restaurant. We'll beat the crowd. That's a popular church. Something wrong with that? You know, I've looked through the scriptures at formal worship services. And I always come back to, oh, Ezra. And Ezra called the people together. And they got there at 6 o'clock in the morning. And they stood to 3 o'clock in the afternoon while he read the word. He read the Bible to them, in other words. He read the Old Testament scriptures to them. The law. Is that too long? Just anybody, is that too long? It's kind of long, isn't it? And they did it in the sun, and they were standing up. And they had children and old folks. They had everybody. Is that too long? And the answer is no, it's not too long be too long for me, but it's really not too long, okay? I, I understand. The question I'm asking you is, what do we give to God? How much time do we give to God? I remember in seminary class, and they talk about tithing, and there's always somebody new that will come in and say, well, you know, I believe my tithe is my time. And that's just open. That's just open the door for these old mean seminary professors. I mean, some of them pretty mean. And they'll eat them out and basically give them this: God demands all your time. He bought you with the blood of His Son Jesus Christ. He owns every minute of your life if you're going to heaven. You may not give it to Him, but you owe Him. And he just wants 10% of your money. And if you want to give a free will offering, it can be a three-legged keg or a short-legged keg. And so he'll eat those guys out, and they'll try to crawl up under the table. And I remember <laughs> Dr. Kelly, Dr. Earl Kelly, said, if anybody wants to crawl up under the table, just know this, I'll get under there with you and finish the conversation. That's what it means. There has to be conviction, and we're not going to be popular. All right? It would be nice if everybody wanted to go to church. But if you preach the word of God that calls people sinful and demands repentance, then you're not going to be, you're not going to be popular. If you go knock on all the doors, 
And they come to the door, and you tell them who you are, and you're from Pine Forest Baptist Church, and I got something I want to tell you. Unless you have Jesus Christ, you, you're, you're going to die and go to hell. You need to repent. If you don't repent, you're going to die and go to hell. If you don't repent, you're going to die and go to hell. And if you don't repent, you're going to die and go to hell. And you know what they're going to tell you? Get out of my house. Right? We're not going to be popular. It's no need trying to be popular. What we need to try to do is please God. And if we can please God, we'll be all right with everybody else because they don't matter. Only God matters. When this world's all over with, you're not going to go to heaven and worship your, your fellow man. You're going to worship God. And He owns all your time here. He certainly owns it all up there. We try to be popular. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 11. To the present hour. Paul says, to right now. We both hunger and thirst. And we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. That's popular people, right? Especially that part about being beaten. Now, look down at verse 13. Being def defamed, we entreat. We have made, we have been made as the fifth of the world, the offscouring of all things unto now. Now that's the church. Paul is the ch he's part of the church. He's starting churches and he's talking to the church. And he says, This is what we are. We're a fifth and offscouring. Y'all know what that is? Huh? You ever seen scabs on people? You know what I'm talking about? Scab? And you pull them off? That's what it is. Sometimes they'll be let the pus out of your arm. If you've got a, maybe a mosquito has bitten you. When I was a kid, I used to scratch mosquitoes. Did y'all ever do that? Get a little sore there and it'll scab up and have pus under it. That's what he's talking about. That's what the church was during Paul's day. They were not popular. Ms. Joyce, you laughing about that? Did you do That's not very popular, you know. And that's what Paul says we are. And so if in Paul's day, the church is reaching more people than, than we'll ever reach here. I mean, Peter preached one day and 5,000 got saved, 3,000 get saved. Churches are starting, persecution comes, the gospel spreads across the world. And Paul said, we're not very popular. We're filthy and we're the scabs of life. Why do we want to be popular? It doesn't work. It's not what God has called us to do. So why do we want to be popular? Why do we want to do what pleases the world when the world gives you bad advice and the world's going to hell? Why do we want to please the world? We want to please, we want to please God and God alone. Here's another one. Failure to properly interpret Scripture. Now, that's a big difference from doctrinal clarity. Properly interpret Scripture. And so I want you to look with me first in James chapter 3 and verse 1. I want to go back to James. Chapter 3 and verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers. Why? Knowing that we shall receive a what? Stricter judgment. So, how do you properly interpret Scripture? Becomes the question. How do you know if you're interpreting the Scripture as God intended it? 
First of all, you never pull out a scripture from the middle of the chapter without reading the whole chapter and the whole book and understanding what the writer is trying to say. You'll always hear me, and I've talked about it before with them young guys sitting in here, context. What is the context of the scripture? And you cannot get it without reading the whole chapter, the whole book, and let me just be honest, the whole Bible. You cannot truly understand the scriptures until you have read them and put them in place. But most people don't do that. Then content. What is the writer trying to say? Because the message back in that day is the same message today. If he's talking about faith back then, he's talking about faith today. If he's talking about love back then, he's talking about love today. The same message applies. I remember I preached a sermon one time. It was on, he shall make the way straight, the road straight. And when you, when you study that, you understand, you go back and get the context, you get the historical background. And what he's talking about is in, in Israel in that day, the Roman army had come in. And you know what they're famous for? Roman roads, right? And they make them as straight as they can make them and as level as they can make them. And they're still using some of the Roman roads today. And in Israel, there are not a lot of mountains, so all the roads are, are straight. And when they come to these little hills, well, they'd go out and get 20,000 slaves, bring them in, give them a pick and a shovel, and they'd cut through that hill, and that road would be level and flat. And so, I made the statement that when Jesus said he's going to make the way straight, they knew what he was talking about. Because they could look at the Roman road and they would understand. Because he's right next to a Roman road while he's preaching. And the guy said, that's not what it means. After service. So I took him into my office. He was a lawyer. And I began to give him the law. Because the scriptures are the scriptures and the content and the context and the language gives us the message. You don't pull it out as so many preachers and so many teachers do today and take one verse here and one over there and put it together and think it's right. You preach the message. Why? Second Timothy chapter two and verse five. Or verse fifteen. Second Timothy chapter two, verse fifteen. Be diligent. To present yourself approved. Okay? Approved to who? To God. A worker who does not need to be what? Ashamed. Doing what? Rightly dividing. You see it there? The word of truth. Now let's go over it again. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed because you are rightly dividing the word of truth. You're rightly pulling the message out and you're teaching the gospel message that is correct according to the scriptures. Because if you don't, somebody's going to call your hand at it and you're going to be what? Ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Then you come to... Another reason, a failure to discipline. The church doesn't discipline anymore. Teach what you want to, act like you want to, and the church doesn't discipline anymore. I don't know if I told, told you all this before, but I have a great aunt. Well, she, I, I used to have a great aunt. She's dead. That She owned a store, and her husband died, and she wasn't making a good living, and so she decided she'd start selling beer in her store. 
And this was in, I was, I was probably seven years old. So it was early 60s. You know what our local church did? Can you imagine what our local church did? Did what? Well, they didn't actually kick her out, but they throwed her out. Almost literally. Why would they throw her out? Do y'all know most Southern Baptist churches have a, uh, uh, what do you call that thing in the back of the book? A, a what? Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Y'all got a church covenant? Does Pine Forest Baptist Church have a church covenant? Do y'all know what it says? We will abstain from the use of and the sale of what? Alcohol as a beverage, right? Because you can use Dr. Tishner's as a mouthwash. You can use mouthwash as a mouthwash. It's got alcohol in it. And they kicked her out of church. And they regretted it. Well, not all of them. A couple of them regretted it. Because when they told her that, she stood up and she said, Well, I'll tell you what, you two deacons, you better not come back and try to buy any beer at my store. <laughs> That's a true story. It, it shows you the hypocrisy of it too, right? They voted her out while they were buying beer from her store. It goes back to that godly living. So we can't discern because we don't discipline anymore. Because he without sin shall cast the first stone. Well, everybody has sin, so we should not cast the first stone. We're not going to cast any stones. But Jesus said, go to that person, right? If somebody's got a problem, you go to that person. If that doesn't work, take somebody with you. If that doesn't work, what do you do? Bring it to the who? Bring it, bring it to the church. Bring it to the elders. Let them handle it. It's got to be dealt with. Everybody has sin, but it's the perpetual, premeditated sins that need to be dealt with. Okay? Another reason is spiritual immaturity. And you can read Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, but I've got to quit. I don't got to quit, but I want you all to come back, so I'm going to quit. I'm not Ezra, and you all not going to stand for it. Okay? Let's go over our prayer list. We've gone over.